Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Katcher. I'm the Communications Director at NOFAST, the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. And uh, my role at NOFAST, I produce a variety of videos, interviews with um, individuals living with FASD, family members, advocates, experts. So this video is going to feature the partnership between NOFAST and NABCA, the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association. NABCA is the National Association representing the control state systems, which are the states and jurisdictions that directly control the sale of alcohol. And NAPCA also supports efforts to protect public health and safety from the harmful effects that can arise from risky drinking. And NOFAS is committed to the prevention of prenatal alcohol exposure, uh, as well as exposure to drugs and other substances known to harm fetal development and supporting individuals, families, and communities living with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or FASDs. So together we've created the FASD Awareness in State Control Agencies or FASA project in 2015, led by NOFAS Vice President and Spokesperson, Kathy Mitchell, in collaboration with the NABCA team. And FASA is an initiative to prevent alcohol exposed pregnancies by increasing FASD education awareness and resources. And NABCA sponsors the initiative focused on educating medical and allied health professionals and students in Mississippi and Pennsylvania. So I'm now going to uh, turn things over to my colleague, Kathy Mitchell. Kathy Mitchell is the vice president and national spokesperson for NOFAS, is also a noted international speaker uh, on FASD and women and addictions, and is also a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. Um, so yes, I'll now turn things over to Kathy. Thank you, Andy. So I can't imagine any initiative that's more important, at least to me, <laughs> than educating our uh, medical and allied health students. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, every student that graduates um, today should have at least the basic information about not only how to prevent uh, uh, future alcohol or other drug exposures, as well as how to diagnose and treat. So today we are so fortunate to have two of the very top-notch pediatricians in the world as far as uh, having the knowledge of FASD. And with both of our special guests, these are not pediatricians that have necessarily done extensive research on FASD, but these are pediatricians that have the grassroots knowledge of not only how to diagnose, but how to talk with uh, the parents how to um, prevent, how to diagnose, and also how to treat and refer. But the most important thing, I think, is that they actually really care. And they're both very passionate about this topic. So we have had the good fortune, once we got that funding from NABCA, <laughs> was like, I know exactly who I wanna pull into this. So I am really, really excited to introduce um, both of our special guests, Dr. Susan Buttress, who is the medical director, I love this title, for the Center for the Advancement of Youth. I mean, how awesome is that? And now Dr. Turchi, Dr. Renee Turchi and I have known each other for years and she is like a hero to me. She's, uh, she's just, so amazing. She has so many titles. I'm going to grab a few of them and then let her, they're both going to tell you more about um, themselves and, and how they got involved in this. But uh, Dr. Turchi, you are the chair of pediatrics, pediatric in chief and medical director for children and youth with special needs at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children. And you're also the medical director at the Pennsylvania Medical Home Program and prof professor of pediatrics at Drexel College of Medicine and the School of Public Health. And I hope those are uh, still correct titles for you, but I, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dr. Buttress and allow her to uh, tell you a little more about herself. Well, Thank you so much, Kathy, and um, talk about an amazing champion for children. Kathy Mitchell's one of those, so it's 
awesome to have the opportunity to work with you. Um, so I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician. I've been um, in practice for 30 plus years now and have participated actually in several projects in the area of mental behavioral health. Um, developmental and behavioral pediatrics um, sees a broad spectrum of children, but, but the reality of it is my love is um, helping children very early in their lives because the sooner you, you touch those children, the better off they'll be. So I've worked in the area of birth to five, early child development, linkage to services, making sure getting appropriate services and that the kids are ready to learn by the time they hit school, by the time they hit kindergarten. And so um, I got interested in uh, the area of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, several years ago when I was asked to participate in a project that was funded uh, to our Department of Mental Health where we looked at teenagers with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder who had been identified. And actually it was in the juvenile justice system. It was a tough project. And that was the time I realized that uh, we all needed to be working earlier to help children, one, to prevent it, and two, if children were affected to intervene early. So I know that was a lot of information, but I just wanted to let you know, um, I teach at the Medical Center. I'm very involved with the National Academy of Pediatrics, I'm a district vice chair for our district right now. And so uh, I feel like it's a great opportunity to, to be able to continue to tout what we need to do to help young children, especially affected by fetal alcohol spectrum. Thank you so much. And, and you're also one of their national, one of the AAP national FASD champions, as is Renee. So Dr. Right. Turchi, if you could just take a moment and introduce yourself. Sure, thank you so much. And thanks for having me here today. Um, and to echo Dr. Buttress's comments, I would say that um, I consider Kathy Mitchell a mentor, a friend, and someone I was just speaking about um, on a, in a discussion on Friday saying, I've got to talk to Kathy about helping me understand this issue and teach me. And so what a privilege to be a part of this work. Um, I'm a pediatrician who, um, I, my area of interest was in children with medical complexity. And so um, shortly after my fellowship, I um, found myself at um, a Department of Health meeting um, where I got to hear um, a speaker, uh, Dan Dubofsky, talk about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And, you know, in my training many years ago, we were trained about fetal alcohol syndrome. And for me, I will remember very distinctly that pivotal moment where I was listening to this talk and sort of thinking through all the children that I had seen and sort of really this pivoting shift and paradigm shift really in thinking about FASD and, um, you know, really at that point had ended up going, um, thinking about the work that we did with children medical complexity and came back and talking to folks saying, we need, to, we need to think about this more. We were missing a whole subset of children and had the great fortune of getting a SAMHSA grant, which launched um, um, a sub part of our center. So we now actually in Pennsylvania have um, a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder diagnostic and treatment center. And I think about, you know, learning and meeting Kathy um, also during FASD National Awareness Day, one of the first times many years ago, I got to hear Kathy speak with Carly, which is uh, probably one of the most inspirational um, talks that I had heard in terms of really thinking about moving this needle and the need, you know, that um, the need to just continue to push ahead and also balancing the prevention with um, the treatment and supporting families and just the role of family partnership um, and the role of organizations like NOFAS and helping us care for families as it goes um, well beyond just the medical piece um, that we do in our center. So I um, feel really privileged uh, to um, think about this work in the clinical area, but as Dr. Brescher is saying, also it really is a public health 
issue. And as I always say about our center is, you know, the bad news is business is good, right? So if we were, if we were doing our good public health effort, we could have prevention um, that would, you know, almost mitigate the need for an FASD center for the work that we do. Um, but um, again, that's, that's really who I am and where my passion comes from. Great. Thank you to, um, to you both. So let's just briefly talk about the projects we were able to accomplish in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, well, starting, starting with Dr. Buttress, we, we had um, a full FASD day planned at the University of Mississippi and, and boy, we were doing it all. We were hitting all the schools the whole day lunch and and it was uh, really going to be something and everything came to a dead halt and um being uh, the champions that we must be some days so we we went went to zoom and we were able to um pull off a a really great um pediatric grand rounds and and you managed to get a lot of participation in um, by not only faculty, but uh, students and many of the other programs. So if you can just talk about that a, a little bit, that'd be great. Right, dear old COVID-19 hit us. And uh, so we did, we had to regroup pretty quickly. And I, I will say that we were very disappointed not being able to have Kathy come in. We, we were, um, going to join with the uh, School of Nursing, nurse practitioners, in addition to our trainees in pediatrics and family medicine. But with the pivot, um, I thought it worked very well. We had a great attendance um, from the School of Nursing, from, from our pediatric residents and our faculty too. Um, in addition, we had a lot of other providers who joined in, speech pathologists, psychologists, and others. So it wasn't your typical pediatric grand rounds, but it was a bigger group collectively of individuals who deal with children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And, um, you know, early on, I trained years ago, uh, there was not much emphasis except on the fetal alcohol syndrome. I think it was very interesting when the question and answers came, um, the sort of surprise um, that continues that uh, people don't understand. You don't, you can look very typical, but still have significant issues from a learning or, or developmental behavioral um, piece. Um, I'll tell you the other thing that was amazing. Um, so many comments back to Kathy. Kathy and I did a joint, joint presentation and Kathy Mitchell talked her story. And um, it was, I think Dr. Turchie's already mentioned this, it, one of the most touching um, stories. And I've heard it before, but many, um, most in, in, who, in attendance had not ever heard the story. And so hearing, hearing, watching this beautiful woman talk about how she had children affected, um, she is not what most people think. Um, would be a parent of a child with a biologic parent of a child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And I think that kind of thing um, helps, helps providers plant themselves a little bit better as to, to why they really need to be open and look and not, not think that this is um, someone who is a neglectful parent who does this on purpose or doesn't care about their children. Um, it really drove it home. And I had comments, um, Kathy, I don't think I've even told you about this. I have had comments still about how good the presentation was, how they felt like it perhaps impacted their ability to better understand, see, and maybe intervene sooner. So I, I felt like even though, even though it was only an hour um, plus a few minutes versus a whole day that we planned, I, th I thought it was incredibly productive. 
Thank you for that. It was a it was a great opportunity, and I received a lot of feedback as well from people after the fact. So, mm-hmm. and Dr. Turchi and I, uh, we we uh, we did not keep it simple. Um, so we had three different presentations uh, going from we went uh, November, January, and March. So we had the FASD one hundred and one. And then we had the uh, January through the lifespan and really got into the spectrum. And then the third one was creating a circle of hope or prevention and the role of uh, the pediatrician and all healthcare providers really in terms of um, prevention. So, but the, the astounding part to me were the numbers of people that you, there were so many students and providers on that call so um uh dr turchi take it away tell us tell us more <laughs> yeah i mean that it was um i felt like it was three italian weddings that we hosted <coughs> together it was really incredible so what what we did was um you know to susan's point i think we all had a pivot with cope with covid And so we had also had, you know, great aspirations to have Kathy come down. But again, with this important topic, I think one thing that COVID sort of allows us to do, and in this case, we tried to really think about how many more people we could touch if we did it virtually. So we really went um, and tried to focus on students. So we um, partnered with the PA chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and also um, Drexel University School of Public Health, School of Nursing, um, medical school and the, their physician assistance uh, school. And then we also um, connected with our local Medicaid. We have one in Philadelphia, one Medicaid managed care plan. Um, and they have lots of trainees that are, um, you know, sitting within the, the behavioral health space. And so we really, um, as we planned, as Kathy sort of beautifully outlined kind of these three talks, we tried to think about them like every other month. And um, Kathy, again, I was always my teacher, reminded me in each talk that we always, we had to think about, you know, okay, are we gonna have some newcomers? Um, We advertise them as sort of a series, but recognize that people might come in and out and we might have folks that just come in for one. So we sort of did, even though we did 101, at the subsequent talks, we sort of spent a little bit of time kind of with a brief recap. Um, I have to say like Kathy, I mean, this, the the numbers were astounding. Um, The first one we had almost 330 people um, and then we had in the uh, low 300s and then um, high twos and then people um, joined in. And we also spent some time after um, the, the talks kind of looking at the CEUs and the CMEs that we gave and some of the students, you know, the, the, the neat thing that I thought was um, just so in, encouraging was the numbers, but also the level of engagement. I mean, for any of you that have had the privilege of hearing Kathy speak, I always said like, I was not the reason the ticket sales were high. Um, it was really Kathy. And you could, you could see that not just in people signing in, but it was the chat. You know, when you're in Zoom, it's kind of a different way. You're losing that person to person, but the amount of enthusiasm, the questions, the moving, the comments we got, after. Um, I just think about it, and we did have some newcomers. So, you know, our estimates um, based on people that had come through is that we hit um, well over 500, um, probably closer to 600 um, professionals as well as students in a variety of disciplines. And um, what I was really excited about for us is that many of us in the medical space, we know that lots of things, but especially FASD, it really While we as physicians are a part of this, I would argue that the mental health space and our nursing students, our medical students, this future workforce, you know, is really where we also need to be kind of catching up those of us that have been out for a little bit, but also kind of having FASDB on the minds of, you know, our public health professionals thinking about prevention. So we had a lot of planning calls with Kathy. She was very gracious with our time, but I think you know, we were all pretty, we, you know, we kept saying like, we sort of had these over under bets. Is the next one going to have as many folks? And sure enough, I think, I think, think they did. And it was incredibly humbling. Um, the last thing I'll say about our events is that having had the great fortune of listening to Kathy speak and hearing her in different um, venues, I'm always amazed at how many times myself while they're preparing or listening to FAST, I always learn. And um, I really felt like for me, this the series that we put together, um, it you know, people, we got a couple of questions in our in our evaluations asking, is there going to be another? So I feel like you we you know that the appetite for this 
um, is is really there. And and um, we did have a lot of folks from Pennsylvania and some outside. So it, I, I feel that it was it was pretty successful. Thanks um, to Kathy and her leadership. Hi, that's that's great. I just wanted to to um, jump in with a, a question. So. You were talking about um, some of the feedback you received on, on Kathy's presentation and others. And um, I was wondering, could you just talk a little bit more about that feedback, any specific feedback that stood out in particular, or what the kind of range was um, with the feedback that you got from the students? Sure. I think um, to Dr. Buttress's point, I think that there's a lot of misconception about um, either having it or not. So I think that there was a lot of, you know, we did pre post tests um, and with fundamental knowledge on our webinars, um, which, you know, really helped with like the credit that we provided. So I think especially early on a lot, it's really, you know, again, when you're in this space and you live it and like for folks like Dr. Pressures, myself or Kathy, right? It's like you, I, I, that's why some of these things are humbling for me because you sort of like forget, right? Like I, I remember myself, which is why I always think about how I got into this. You know, my training was always like you had the facial features. So I think that that was a big piece. I think the other um, big part of the feedback that we received um, in, in the early lectures were just the importance of interdisciplinary teams and that this, you know, integration between mental health, physical health and the community partners and especially the role of parent partners. Um, the life course approach, Kathy's, the feedback that, you know, Kathy, what, what I loved about the way Kathy sort of structures is she, she talks about her role as a parent, um, you know, early on and sort of lessons learned. And I think that piece of the life course and that second set where folks really, um, some of the feedback we got was how Kathy really describes kind of those early on years and her experience um, with her child, you know, with Carly as a, as a youngster, but also into adulthood and how it affects the whole family and the prevention. And the culmination with the circle of hope, I feel like was brilliant. Um, people were moved. People were so inspired. Um, Kathy's humility in sharing her story, the very specific feedback of making it real um, and having someone be able to, you know, talk about um, in a really vulnerable way, um, you know, publicly about what's happened, but then talk about the hope and the way what was so um, really inspiring to me too were the number of students and folks from the mental health space that really talked about um, how to frame, um, you know, um, the hope when you're working with um, clients or patients um, that have a substance abuse challenge and how, to, you know, to really the stigma, um, the way to engage. I, I feel like that was one of the really big things that a lot of the students and folks that engaged really felt like it really hit home that, you know, we're not there to judge. And, um, you know, some of the specific feedback too talked a little bit about, um, you know, this, you know, I would almost go as far to say even clinically, like sort of the tension sometimes that exists between adoptive and biologic moms. And I feel like Kathy has this, um, the word that always comes to mind is like a grace, you know, a grace about talking about this where um, she puts herself out there in a, with a story that's incredibly, you know, raw and deep and personal. And then, and, and sort of pulls it around to a place of just incredible advocacy and, and using lessons learned and talking about no fast. And um, we had um, a couple of folks, uh, uh, we had a student that actually came and told us that in one of her placements, she had no fast. She told her agency about no fast and how it's going to be one of the, and they weren't familiar with it. So I, I always think about sort of that pay it forward, you know, that one person and then how they, um, they spread it. And I, I, I think, you know, um, the ability to be so engaging and to, you know, sometimes when you also see, we were co commenting on this, our team when you're on Zoom, you know, where you see people kind of dropping off the numbers dwindling. In, in our experience, we did not have that. And that was very evidenced by the comments in the chat and at the end, just this incredible thanking Kathy for her um, willingness to, to share her story. And I think, you know, you might say, my goodness, three. I, I, I really, I think that, 
Kathy's um, skill in being able to kind of sprinkle in some personal, you know, um, I think she certainly is the was was more of the yang to my yang when in the continent when I was talking a little more about the medical piece. So her ability to kind of punctuate um, with an evidence base and talk about the research but link it to real world living um, was something that really resonates. And we saw a you know very impressive kind of pre post um, improvement in scores. So I had a question about, um, you're talking about the stigma and many pediatricians, as we know, are not comfortable with making a diagnosis of an FASD. Could you talk about that in particular, some of the barriers there, how those barriers are being addressed, what you, would, what you maybe would personally say to those pediatricians that are not comfortable making a, a diagnosis? One issue is that um, individuals tend to think that um, children affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder come from a certain economic group or cultural group or racial group, and that's just not true. It's across the board. So how do you how do you work with trying to convince individuals that um, that yes, it's a disorder. Yes, it's something that the child was affected by, but um, it is something that we can work with, we can help these children and to try to avoid putting the children in the same box. And again, like I said earlier, I think that part of the issue um, that was helped so much, and I would love, you know, we recorded, um, our grand rounds on WebEx because I really wanted it to reach even more people than it did, even though we had good numbers. Um, so that people could see that caring, loving parents can have a child affected, um, especially if they don't have clear knowledge of what alcohol during pregnancy can do, and if we don't do a better job of prevention. And I think we all know that we haven't done as good of a job as we could. Um, so, so stigma is a big part. I think one, one area in which I have had many people thank me and Kathy for, as we are talking through, how do you even take a history? How do you get the nerve up to say, um, did you drink alcohol during pregnancy? Because that's always been a difficult area. And I, I think clearly that is why many times it goes undiscovered is because um, pediatricians and, and other primary care providers are just not comfortable asking the question. And so, you know, learning to, to be kind, to understand that um, parents always put guilt on themselves when they have a child with a special needs. They always are certain they did something um, that perhaps caused it. Maybe it was genetic. Maybe it was an illness they had. Maybe it was something they took, a medicine or maybe a drug. So I think to, to learn how to ask questions and understand that, that parents in general often do already feel guilt they don't need more guilt. What they need is compassion and understanding and help um, on how to move into uh, getting away from stigmatizing and, and better understanding what the issues are, what is needed, how they can help, how you make the diagnosis. And if you're not, not absolutely sure about the diagnosis, what maybe you need to do um, to, to help clarify things. But just simple things like, um, instead of saying, did you drink during pregnancy, to understand that it's important to say something like, how far into your pregnancy were you before you found out you were pregnant? Um, how much did you drink prior to pregnancy? To try to stage things into many times people, I was one of them, many times women don't know that they're pregnant immediately. Um, occasionally a pregnancy is a surprise. So to set the stage um, so that, that individuals can understand that 
the history taking and the discovery is not accusatory, but it's in a manner that is trying to help in a man manner that's trying to understand um, where the problems or the difficulties might lie in, in the child as you're moving forward to try to help them. I've always wondered what it would be like to be a pediatrician and here you have, you know, the mom or the parents in the room and you have a child and you're thinking this could be effects from being exposed and how you, how you, you, you just gave such a great response, Dr. Buttress on, on techniques on how to do that. But how do you approach it when you're, when you're pretty certain and then you're concerned about, um, you know, like issues around reporting or having to connect or getting so much information that, um, you know, there's safety issues and, and child protective services, getting them involved. So how do you, and how do you communicate that to the parents so they feel safe to be honest with you and they know that you're in, you know, they're in, you're in their court, but you, you still need to get at the information to get the right diagnosis for their child. So if both of you could just talk about that a little bit. Maybe I'll start and Renee, I'll turn it over to you. Um, so that always is an issue. Being at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, we are our only children's hospital. And so we, we are essentially the center that serves um, all children. And so often there is a concern, um, even just referral into our center, a concern that perhaps people are judging you and perhaps um, CPS, Children's Child Protective Services will be called in if they discover anything. And so I think the one, one issue is very important to be, be very sensitive. And, and so, again, just to make sure um, what I do um, when I feel like that, that this perhaps is a child who was affected and the biologic parent is present, we talk about, tell me about your concerns, tell me where the child is having the greatest difficulty, and then we'll talk through and I'll typically say, you know, if you were honest enough to talk to us about your alcohol intake and during pregnancy, and this could have affected your child. And these are the things that, and I go through a descriptive of the, this is what we see in a child with, who falls under the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. These are the behaviors. So many times there's significant problems with attention span, or there's this sort of emotional dysregulation. And I talk to the parents about what that is, but there are ways we can help that. And so to talk through. So, you know, often parents, by the time we get through the information, um, feel like, yeah, this is my child. And yes, we do need help. And we try to lay it out as we are here only to help. Um, and that is where we are. And you appear, you know, if, if a, there's a loving, caring parent there who's come to us for help, obviously um, no reporting is going to happen. Now, if there is a, a parent where we have significant concerns, um, obviously intervention has to happen. But I will say by, by and large, when a parent, a biologic parent comes into our center with the behavioral concerns or the developmental concerns of a child, um, if you approach it correctly as a helper, um, not an accuser, then, then typically the parents are very happy to get the help. But I think that's one of the issues. That's why this program is so important is because a lot of times people don't know, providers don't know how to approach it. And sometimes they get angry 
that a parent did this to a child. Um, when, you know, I think we try hard to teach that this is not, this is not a direction to go. This is not productive and it's not the way we should be. So I think having programs like this where you educate um, providers how to deal with this, the, the better off they'll be. And Renee, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I think that was an excellent um, description. I think, I think part of it is that trust. What I what I've also learned a bit, you know, sometimes is um, is really gauging. You know, it's, it's tough sometimes the first time you meet someone, like in anything, in any relationship, right? Like you're, I I often find, and when we sort of talk about screening for alcohol exposure, I often teach about. I call it universal precautions, you know, meaning that like when we think about hand washing, like when you're going to go see a patient and you wash your hands, when you're doing a birth history or you're, you know, that we should think about um, screening for alcohol exposure in that same regard, it should be elevated. But I often, um, you know, it's not, it's not what I lead with. Um, and I think it's also, you know, the, the, how you ask the question. And I often talk a lot with parents personally. Um, I feel like I've become a much better pediatrician since I've been a mom. I spend, um, sometimes I will, depending, it really depends on the scenario, but I talk a lot about how being a mom is the hardest job I've ever had. I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, I also, I'm a, I'm a cancer survivor. And so I talk a little bit about um, if I have a suspicion and I talk a little bit about things that were beyond my control. And I liken my cancer diagnosis to alcoholism and, and you know, in the diagnosis and just things that, you know, we, we never intentionally are trying to harm our, our children. And um, so I, I think sometimes it's, I think to your point, it's, and it really, um, I also talk about us being partners in, in wanting the best. We have the same goals, which is, you know, helping the child. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to partner with you to take the best care of your child. And I've had situations where sometimes, you know, um, sometimes moms or caregivers don't admit to me. I always say to my team, I'm not, I never get upset or concerned if someone talks or discloses alcohol use to a social worker, community health worker, or to a nurse. We just want to help kids and families. And, and to me, it's about building that rapport. And I think like anything else, like as being on the other side, you know, someone has to feel um, trust before they, and to your point, Dr. Buttress, know that this isn't, um, you know, because there is some, you know, stigma out there. There's some history about using information against folks. Um, I often will talk a lot about, you um, you know, just that this information, and I talk a little bit just about how we know that um, alcohol can affect their brain differently. And it just helps us to understand because, you know, and I'll, I'll use analogies to how we treat different things based on knowing what the cause is. And, um, but, I, but I think the fundamental big take home for me is a lot of it is that foundation of trust um, because I think that you have to build that. And sometimes I find that that disclosure um, doesn't always come on the first visit. Um, unless someone in our fetal alcohol spectrum disorder center, sometimes folks are obviously they're there for a reason. They've sought us out. If it's in a, you know, they have a suspicion where it might be in a slightly different, you know, scenario where they're seeking us out for that reason. But, you know, the approach in general for pediatricians, I think it's, it's, I often say that's why we have to think about revisiting this topic, not just the first time you see a patient. Well, I, I can't thank the two of you enough. I know we could really uh, drill down into this topic and talk together for hours and hours, at least I could. I really, really appreciate your um, expertise um, from both of you and also for being champions with, with for NOFAS in helping us to pull off these very important sessions um, in 2020 to reach medical and other healthcare um, professional students. And um, the one thing in my, in closing, I would just like to say is I've never met a mother who purposely hurt her own child. And for the majority of birth mothers, they do suffer with a disease that is treatable. And I just, if I could wave a magic wand, I just wish more um, medical schools taught about, you know, the disease of uh, substance use and alcohol use um, disorders. And the other piece to this 
is it is about compassion and kindness. So, you know, I always, another thing I, I'm known to say, never underestimate the power of giving your patients just two minutes of your time where you're really connecting on a human to human level and you're letting them know that they matter. And that's the answer. Though with knowing those two things, there's no bad guys here. People doing the best that we can, but we shouldn't let fear get in the way. But I'm gonna turn it over to, to Andy to close us out. But I love both of you so much and thank you so much for what you do. You really make a difference. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks so much. I was just gonna gonna ask in closing if there's anything else that you'd like to say, any final points, uh, final messages that you'd like to, to make. One, one thing I would say that I don't know if I emphasized enough in my comments is the importance of partnering with families. You know, the one thing I've learned in fetal, early on when we first started our fetal alcohol, so forgive me if I'm going on um, to an earlier point, but I don't know if I made it clearly enough. Like it was, it was really Kathy, you know, and helping me also navigate adoptive parents and no fast and sort of that idea of helping in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, you know, where sometimes it's adoptive parents that sometimes have this underlying, you know, um, also kind of preconceived notions about biologic parents. And I think the importance of partnering with families, you know, during the diagnosis, um, before, during, and after. You know, I often feel like it's sometimes so hard for families to hear anything is wrong with their child, but sometimes that's when the journey's really beginning. And so I have just found the resources that NOFAS offers, the videos, and just sort of the teaching that I feel like as a clinician, I'm always humbled to learn about the family partnerships um, are really integral um, to thinking about this. And that's, I think, a big driver and a take home point that we really tried, I think, to emphasize. So, you know, the fact that an organization like NOFAS is out there um, in, in a sort of agnostic to biologic, adoptive, it's just, you know, it truly is the circle of hope no matter where you are. And I think as clinicians to recognize um, the importance of those family partnerships, that's one of the things I think, again, for this developing of this future workforce, no matter where they're coming from, medical, but mental health, community partners, public health, I think that that's really important. You know, we need more advocacy groups like NOFAS to continue to educate us and are also agnostic to any, um, I think, like hierarchical institution. You know, they're sort of, they're, they're polygamists, if you will, and that's good because we need them to, to stud their tentacles. You know, they're, they're coming at this in, in a way that's, um, that just sort of helps families regardless of their position and, and that family partnership can't be um, overemphasized in my opinion. Oh, I just wanna ditto that. I think the, the partnership understanding that, you know, back in the old days, it was the physician who was sort of quote captain of the ship and you just told people what they needed. And, and I think one of the questions that, that we try to use on a regular basis when, when families come into our center is, tell me what you hope to leave with. Tell me what your hopes of what you can gain from this visit and subsequent visits, absolutely. I think your point too, Renee, is that that often it becomes a relationship. So not just one visit, not just one diagnosis, but to make sure that parents understand and families understand that you'll hold their hand through this and you'll get them to where they need to go. And again, the no fast resources are um, incredible and continuing to have that, but also to continue to make sure that we prepare our workforce, the future workforce better than we were prepared for because a lot of us have had to do backwards learning. Um, if we can send everybody forward with the whole knowledge base they need, we'll be better off. All of our children will be better off. Great point. Amen. Well, thank you again, ladies. Thank and you. Thank you. Have a great Bye -bye. day.